Hi, I'm Colin Weeks. I'm going to talk to you about the state of chemotherapy for pancreas cancer. So here you see the pancreas, and the pancreas sits right behind the stomach in a little pocket and fits into the curvature of the, the wadnum. Pancreas cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, and this actually underestimates the lethality of this disease. Approximately 44,000 patients will be diagnosed with pancreas cancer in this upcoming year, and approximately 44,000 patients will die from this disease as well. And so what is the survival? So if you look at the five-year survival of all patients with pancreas cancer shown here, it's about 4%. If you then ask the question, how do patients do based upon stage, you can see that there is a difference. So those patients who have local disease, stage 1 or 2 disease that's receptible, their five-year survival is approximately 18% whereas those patients who have advanced disease, either unresectable disease or metastatic, mean that it's gone to another organ, the most common organ would be the liver, you can see that their survival at five years is quite poor. Unfortunately, the majority of patients who are diagnosed with this disease are diagnosed with advanced disease, and therefore the overall survival is what we see here at approximately 4% at five years. So before we go into the chemotherapy aspects, I'd like to talk a little bit about the biology of the disease so we can try to understand how the biology may be impacting our lack of therapeutic effects with chemotherapy. So pancreas cancer is a molecular disease in which a series of events occur resulting in the patient developing cancer. And so this is depicted here. You can see that this is normal ductal epithelium of the pancreas, and then it goes through various pre-malignant stages called pancreas intraepithelial neoplasms, ultimately resulting in the frank pancreas cancer. And what you can see here is that as the cells transition from normal through these premalignant states onto pancreas cancer, they develop specific genetic abnormalities. So, for example, here we see KRAS and HER2 new abnormalities occurring in patients with pan and one disease. Ultimately, patients with pancreas cancer will have multiple genetic abnormalities as demonstrated here, and this underlies the difficulty in treating this disease. What we're looking at here is a pancreas that's been sliced into multiple slices. Within these slices, there's various phases of pancreas cancer. The circle here in white are normal cells. The circles here in black are dead necrotic cells. The yellow circles represent parental or the beginnings of pancreas cancer clone. And then these blue to green colored circles represent secondary clones that have the capacity to now develop metastatic disease. If you then look at the parental clones here in yellow, then what you can see is that as these clones develop into those that can result in metastatic disease in various sites, they undergo different genetic abnormalities. And so in the parental clone, you have the set of genetic abnormalities occurring here. And then as you go to development of peritoneal metastases, you can see that we are acquiring additional genetic abnormalities. This continues to occur until we develop cells that have the capacity to metastasize to the liver versus those that have the capacity to metastasize to the lung. And so the importance of this is that there is a parental clone or a set of genetic abnormalities that are consistent within all of these tumors. However, the peritoneal metastases versus liver metastases have different genetic abnormalities that may be targetable genetic abnormalities for the treatment of this disease. Another key thing that's been developed in the last couple of years is the understanding of the time frame of the development of metastases. So from the time the patient tumor is initiated to the development of a true parental clone is approximately 11 years. And you can see that in these black arrows, there's just a number of mutations that are occurring throughout this time period. And then from the time that the parental tumor becomes metastatic or gains that capacity to become metastatic, this is an additional seven years. And then it's an additional two to three years to develop clinical metastatic disease. And so we're actually seeing patients at this very last two years of a 20-year process. And so we've got to find a better way to isolate these early cancerous lesions in which we can ultimately affect the outcome in patients versus our current situation where we're predominantly treating patients with a very advanced disease. So this is an interesting slide in that what it demonstrates is that on average, pancreas cancers have approximately 60-odd genetic abnormalities in a given tumor. And so if you look at pancreas cancer, on average, these tumors have about 60 different genetic abnormalities 
within them, and you can actually classify these abnormalities into different genetic pathways. And so what you see here, there's approximately 12 genetic pathways that predominantly occur in pancreas cancer. It doesn't mean that all of the genetic abnormalities that we see are confined to these different pathways, but these are common amongst patients with pancreas cancer. If you then look at two different patients, so patient one here, patient two here, and you look at a given genetic pathway, so we'll just look at TGF beta signaling here, you can see in this patient, the patient's had a mutation in SMAD4 gene, whereas this patient has had a mutation in the BMPR2 gene. So even though the pathway is affected commonly, the actual genetic event or the gene that's disrupted isn't always the same between patients. The other important thing to think about in terms of developing therapies for pancreas cancer is depicted here. And what this shows is that the tumor itself is predominantly stromal components and has a minority of the pancreas tumor cells deriving the tumor bulk. This is different than most cancers that we know about. So, for example, if you looked at colon cancer under a microscope, what you would see is sheets of cancerous cells, whereas here we just see little nests of pancreas tumors, and then we have all of this stromal component here in the pink and this loose material surrounding those cells. And so in thinking about how we've developed therapy for pancreas cancer over the course of time, most of the research that's been done in the laboratories has focused on trying to develop therapies for these cells. And so having done that, there are a number of chemotherapy agents that have been evaluated in the lab that do result in killing of these cells. However, when you try to translate that into patient care, it doesn't work. And so the question becomes, what is the relationship between the stromal components and the pancreas cancer cells? How does the stromal components of the tumor impact the genetic abnormalities that we just talked about within the pancreas cancer cell? So this is just a diagram of various components of a pancreas tumor. If you look at that tumor, there's a number of different cells within that tumor. You have these sort of general pancreas cancer cells. You have these pancreas cancer stem cells. So the pancreas cancer stem cells are cells that are thought to have the capacity to develop metastases when the cell goes from the pancreas to another organ, like the liver. In contrast, the pancreas cancer cell, the general cell here, doesn't have the capacity to develop a metastatic tumor if it goes to another organ. In addition, we have stromal components, so there's a number of cells that characterize the stroma, including fibroblasts, pancreas delate cells, and the phyllial cells, which are important for development of vessels, and then immune cells. And then we also have the extracellular matrix, which forms the structural network of the tumor, and it has a number of proteins that are involved in the scaffolding of the tumor. The important thing also to note is that there's very different gene pathways that are important for the generalized pancreas cell versus those that are important for the stem cell. And once again, if you then look at the stroma, there's some that are common, but there are also different sets of genes that are important for the stroma component as well. And so the key thing moving forward with the treatment of pancreas cancer, and particularly molecular therapy for pancreas cancer, will be to understand how these different pathways in these different cells interact with one another to then promote the development of a pancreas tumor. So this slide I'm showing you is just to sort of think about how does molecular definition of pancreas cancer impact the outcome of these patients. And so what they did here was to take a number of patients with pancreas cancer and do what we call a microarray analysis or a gene expression profile and then define patients based upon their gene expression. And so what they're able to do is to define three different patient categories, and then they ask the question, how does each category determine the survival of these patients? And so what you can see here is that the patients who have the exocrine pathway or this PDA pathway, their survival is markedly worse than those patients who have the classic genetic pathway. And so we still have a ways to go to improve the outcome for these patients, but as we understand these molecular definitions a little bit better, we can then begin to develop therapies specific for patients with these molecular abnormalities. This is what's currently being done in patients with lung cancer as well as in patients with breast cancer. 
Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our Grace Casts, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info, and that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support.